Uh, good morning, everybody. Is it Khuyamurin? Is that in Afrikaans? Yes. I was at the Drakensberg camp meeting last year, and um, I learned how to say uh, Bri is Laka. Is that how you say it? Bri is Laka, or something like that. I, I learned a few Afrikaans words, and um, I'm not sure what they really mean, but uh, there were some guys down there teaching me. Well, they said, this is how you speak Afrikaans. And I'm not sure whether they were playing a joke on me or not. So I learned a few phrases, um, something about the blue bulls, I remember. Uh, I don't remember what exactly they were teaching me about the blue bulls, but um, apparently I like the blue bulls. Um, so uh, anyway, it's a privilege to be with you here today and to be sharing with you. Uh, my name is Pastor Conrad Vine. I'm sorry, I really don't have any Afrikaan language. Uh, I speak uh, English and Russian. My wife is Russian. And uh, so I bring greetings from my wife. And we have two children. Uh, our son David is 20 years old. And uh, our daughter is 16. And uh, so uh, it was uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Berrien Springs when I left yesterday or Thursday. And uh, I was told it's going to be cold here in South Africa. And it really is quite, quite a shock to the system uh, to come from 90 degrees uh, to here. But anyway, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing about the Beatitudes of Jesus. Now, uh, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't aware that I was talking about the Beatitudes until yesterday at about four o'clock. And uh, Rihanna and John told me, oh, you're speaking about the Beatitudes. And I said, oh, am I? And they said, yes, you are. So I'm going to be speaking about the Beatitudes this morning. Well, I think it's important that we talk about uh, the teachings of Jesus because um, as disciples of Jesus, it's important that we spend some time reflecting on the teachings of Jesus. Uh, it's very hard to say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and not actually spend any time thinking about what he actually taught us. And uh, when we focus, particularly as missionaries, um, on the, the Gospel Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, to go you into the whole world to make disciples of all peoples, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you, for instance, it's important that we actually know what Jesus commanded us. And so we're going to spend our Sabbath school and our worship service, and then this afternoon again at 2 o'clock, we're going to be working our way through the Beatitudes of Jesus. Now, now the Beatitudes of Jesus, uh, we think they're very simple. And uh, when you look at um, Adventist theology, uh, what you realize is that Adventists major in about five or six books of the Bible. In the Old Testament, we major in Exodus uh, because of the Lamb of God motif that goes through to John and then Revelation. Uh, we also major in Leviticus because of the sanctuary service and Daniel. And in the New Testament, we focus on John and Revelation. And so um, very, very few Adventist writers actually write about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, they're called synoptic uh, because about 70% of the underlying Greek is word for word the same. So synoptic means that they're seen through the same set of eyes. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, those Gospels are similar to each other. Uh, they're quite distinct from John. John is a very different Gospel altogether. And so we, we write a lot about the Gospel of John, but we don't talk much about the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, because we tend to assume that they may be kind of more simple than John. John is a very profound Gospel. But actually, when you look into the synoptic Gospels, you realize there is an incredible depth to them. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, some of the teachings of Jesus, and in particular the Beatitudes. And if, I can, if we can bring up this uh, thing on the screen here. Do we have the slides ready to go up? Oh, there we are. All right. So let me just, um, just remind myself. Where are we? The meek. All right. So that's where we're going. That's where we're going through our Sabbath school here today, okay? Just, why, just so I know myself as well. So, let's start out with the Beatitudes. If you, if you want to have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be looking through this. And for our Sabbath school this morning, we're going to be looking through the first three Beatitudes. And uh, I hope we're going to get through all of this, because there's a lot to get through here. And then this afternoon, and this, for Sabbath school, for worship, we'll hopefully get through the remaining Beatitudes. So, um, the Beatitudes. What are they? They're the teachings of Jesus, originally passed on as an oral tradition by the disciples, and then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were 
um, recorded by Matthew and by Luke. And there are two versions of the Beatitudes. One is found in Matthew 5, where that's the one we're most familiar with. And then there is another version of the Beatitudes found in Luke 6. We're just going to compare and contrast those in a few minutes. But in general, the, the word, the, whenever we think of the Beatitudes, we think of the word blessed. Is that right? Blessed. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And so the word blessed is, is worth just thinking about what does the word blessed actually mean. And so, um, if I uh, click on this, yeah. So there are, um, there are a couple of words you put up on the screen there. Eulogeo is a Greek word. We get the word eulogy from that. And uh, that parallels the Hebrew word baraka, which means blessing. Now, this isn't the word that we find in the, in the Beatitudes here. Um, the, the word eulogy or baraka is normally, the, the sense of that is when you say, O oh Lord, um, bless this house, O oh, oh Lord, bless this marriage, or O oh Father, um, bless us as we go through our program today. So you use the word baraka or eulogeo, um, in the Greek that is, and baraka is Hebrew, when you're asking for God's blessing upon something. But the blessing has yet to arrive. But those, that is not the word that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes. He actually uses the word um, makarios up here, and parallels the Hebrew word asir. So makarios has a different meaning altogether. Uh, makarios recognizes that somebody is already blessed by God. It's not a request for a blessing, but it's a recognition that God has already, God's blessing already rests upon this individual. So, for instance, um, if we, the, the, the attitudes do not mean, for instance, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It does not mean if you are merciful, then you will receive God's mercy. That would be the sense if you use the word um, eulogeo there. But the sense of the, that Jesus uses is the word that he uses implies that um, those who practice mercy are already blessed today by God. That you already are in a state of blessedness. That to be a disciple of Jesus and to be living under God's blessing means that this is the kind of life you live. It's not something that you aspire to. This is something you already do as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so um, today, uh, we're going to be looking through the first of these disciples, um, uh, the, th the first of these, first three of these Beatitudes here. But before we do that, just, uh, just a reminder to ourselves of the structure of the Beatitudes. So if you open your Bibles to Luke 6, you'll see there that this is the structure of the Beatitudes in Luke 6. And in Luke 6, you have four blessings, uh, and then that's followed by four woes. And so Luke says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And so there's the blessing here. And then blessed are those who are hungry now, for you shall be filled. And blessed are those who weep now, for you will laugh. And then you have the, uh, the question of persecution here. We'll dwell on that and come back to that in a few minutes. And then you have the, the corresponding, um, the contrast. So here, blessed who are poor, and woe to those who are rich. Blessed are those who are hungry, woe to those who are full. Blessed are those who are weeping, woe to those who are laughing, and blessed are those who are hated, and woe isn't always what it seems. You can't evaluate or judge um, where, where you're standing with God, depending on the size of your bank balance, whether you're feeling good today or not. That your relationship with God transcends and goes beyond how wealthy you are, how happy you are, how sick or ill or healthy you happen to be today. So the point about these Beatitudes is that we need to see beyond the visibles in life to understand our true standing with God. And in this, in this series of Beatitudes here, at the heart of these Beatitudes, you have the Son of Man. And in, in Luke's Beatitudes, Jesus doesn't appear in these three Beatitudes. He doesn't appear in these four Beatitudes. He appears in the middle of the Beatitudes. And this, this one here is quite an extensive Beatitude here. But at the heart of this, you have the Son of Man. And uh, the point about Luke's Beatitudes is that uh, Jesus is to be at the heart of your life. He's the center of your life, and everything else revolves around him. Um, and that's quite different to Matthew's Beatitudes. Now, in Matthew's Beatitudes, which I just put up on the screen here now, Matthew follows a different, a different um, structure to his Beatitudes when he records them. You find that in your Bible in Matthew chapter 5. So in Matthew's Beatitudes, you have a series of, of blesseds all the way through, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Um, blessed are the pure in heart, think, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. And then these two here, persecuted and reviled, are basically one beatitude. And in Luke's beatitudes, Jesus appears right in the middle. But in Matthew's beatitudes, Jesus only appears at the middle of the final beatitude here, on my account. And in both beatitude, sets of beatitudes, Jesus appears in the midst of persecution. Jesus appears in the Beatitudes in the context of persecution. That is, you are closest to Jesus, or Jesus is closest to you in the midst of persecution for his name, rather than during the good times of life. That when you are facing persecution for your faith, when people reject you within your family, within your marriage, uh, within your workplace, maybe within society at large, when you are rejected because you bear the name of Christ, that is paradoxically when Jesus is closest to you. And it's not a sign that he's abandoned you, uh, but it's a sign that he's walking with you through that fiery furnace. And so uh, in Luke, uh, the question is, is Jesus the center of your life? And in Matthew's Beatitudes, the question is, is Jesus the goal or the climax of your life? Are you looking forward to meeting Jesus again one day? Uh, because the Christian life can be a bit like a long-distance relationship. And if you've had a long-distance relationship, you know that you, there's always that, that anticipation of meeting someone again, maybe after six months, but you're never quite sure how it's going to be when you meet them. And when you do meet them, you're always thinking to yourself, is this worth hanging on for another six months until I next see them again or not, okay? Some of you are smiling, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so, uh, in, the, in Matthew's gospel, uh, the, Jesus is the climax of the Christian life. He is the goal of the Christian life. Um, he is the one at whom we aim. We want to become more like him. Whereas in Luke's Beatitudes, Jesus is the center of your Christian life, and our life revolves around him and his teachings. So let's just come to the first of the Beatitudes here, shall we? And it's blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, Luke says blessed are the poor, and Matthew records blessed are the poor in spirit. So does, does this indicate that the poor, the poor of this earth by themselves because they're poor, are blessed by God? Or does it mean that Matthew has sold out for a wealthier audience here, and he's softened the teachings of Jesus that blessed are the poor, but now Matthew says blessed are the poor in spirit, which is a different meaning altogether. Well, neither of those options really is what Jesus is talking about here. And the phrase poor in spirit is a profound expression of what it means to live in God's kingdom. So why do we say this? Well, firstly, in the Gospels, we do not find that poverty is an idealized spiritual condition. Nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus that there is something intrinsically good or more spiritual about being poor. Okay, it is not God's plan for us to live in poverty. We see that through the scriptures, we'll delve into that in a few minutes. But we find in the Gospels that poverty is neither a hindrance nor a condition for salvation. Now, in the Middle Ages, poverty was an idealized state. And if you became a monk in the monasteries of Europe, um, you would take a vow of poverty, for instance. And it was uh, considered that if you, if you were of a, a spiritual elite, you were, high, you were more advanced spiritually if you took a vow of poverty. But nowhere does Jesus portray poverty as the ideal condition of life in which to follow after him. And so the Beatitude does not require us to be poor, and that is financially, in order to be a disciple of Jesus or to receive God's blessing. But God, Matthew actually presents God as a God who lacks nothing and who wishes for his children to lack nothing. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to, just keep your fingers in Matthew 5 and turn to Exodus 3. In Exodus chapter 3, you will see that uh, God is talking about the promised land here. And in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, um, God speaks to Moses at the burning bush. And it says there, then the Lord said, this is Exodus 3 and verse 7, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry and account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so in God's promise to the people of Israel, he was going to bring them to a land of plenty. God did not intend to bring them to a wilderness, to a place where there was nothing good. When God promised to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, which was a land of plenty, he was going to bring them to another land of plenty, to a land flowing with the proverbial milk and honey. And so we might say that poverty and the silent suffering that it represents, represents a denial of the goodness and the perfection of God. 
We also see in this beatitude that salvation comes to those, as Jesus says, who are poor in spirit. But what exactly does poor in spirit mean? Well, Jesus is, uh, many of these beatitudes are reflections on passages of the Old Testament. And if you t turn your Bibles to Isaiah 66 and verse 2, you'll see there some of where Jesus is getting his teachings from. Isaiah 66 and verse 2, and I have the wrong quote here, so you're going to have to forgive me on that. Um, Isaiah 58 and verse 7, my apologies. Isaiah 58 and verse 7. Uh, this is one of the uh, this is one of the acceptable things to do on the Sabbath day, according to Jesus, according to Isaiah. Is is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? So, what is Jesus talking about in this parable here? Well, Isaiah um, says this, but this is the one upon whom I will look, to the humble and contrite in spirit who trembles at my word. Now, Isaiah rarely uses the word poor to talk about those who physically can't feed themselves. But in the majority of cases where the prophet Isaiah uses the word poor, he's talking about those who are mature enough to realize that they need God's grace, that they don't have all the answers in life. So the poor in spirit, according to Isaiah, are those who realize that even no matter how good their life may look on the outside, they have an internal need for God, and only God can supply that need. And so they, if the, the, those who are not poor in spirit think that they have all the answers to life, but those who are poor in spirit, they tremble at the word of God, they recognize that they are sinners, and they recognize they're in need of God's grace. And what Jesus is saying here is the kingdom of God cannot be received by full hands. If my hand is full with the concerns of this world, my hand is full with my own self-sufficiency, my hand is full with just busyness of life, I have little time or aptitude or inclination to receive God's grace in my life. Jesus is warning us here against worldly self-sufficiency. Firstly, that is the, when we have the absence of physical need, we start to trust ourselves and our physical resources to get us through life. And our, we no longer trust in God for our daily bread. And God is also, Jesus is also warning us against religious self-sufficiency. What do I mean by that? Well, it happens when you may be born into a Christian home, you have a Christian education, you have a mother or a grandmother who prays for you, you may have achieved a terminal degree, you are a church member in good and regular standing, your life is full of good deeds, you understand the 28 fundamental doctrines, you live an upright and seemingly moral life, that beyond death there is meaning and there is purpose. And so those who are poor in spirit come to God with open hands, recognizing their desperate need of the Savior. So what are the implications of this beatitude that blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, for, they shall, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Firstly, that poverty in any country is a sign that God's perfect plan, plan for humanity is not being fulfilled. Now, according to Matthew 11, in verses 2 through 6, Jesus teaches that the poor have good news to, brought to them. And it is only well-fed Christians who assume that food is not a tangible manifestation of the good news to those who are chronically hungry. So the teaching of the parables later, in the, the teaching of the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, Jesus reiterates that if we want to share in the kingdom of God and when Jesus comes in glory, that we're to be involved in alleviating various forms of poverty and suffering today. In Matthew 25, the acid test for our entry into eternal life is not so much what we believe, but what we do for our neighbor in need, whether we're willing to help our neighbors in need. Uh, yes, uh, you know, we pay taxes, I pay taxes, I mean, I hate paying taxes, actually. I actually resent paying taxes. Some of you may agree with me on that feeling. I resent paying taxes. Uh, I know some of that taxes goes on Social Security, for instance, and I guess, you know, that's fine. But um, that doesn't excuse me from the responsibility when somebody in my immediate circle is in need, do I reach out a helping hand or not? You know, I used to work for ADRA for many years, and... Um, you might say that my job was helping people in need. I was floating around Central Asia and East Africa for many years. Um, but that doesn't relieve me of the responsibility when somebody comes into my sphere of influence and they're in desperate need, am I going to help them or not personally? It's not just my job to help you. Am I gonna, do I have a sense of compassion in my heart for you? And so those who are poor in spirit 
Um, they, they work to reverse the conditions that bring about poverty in any society. Secondly, in this passage, this beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, we see that if the poor in spirit inherit the kingdom of God, then the proud in spirit do not. That the proud, being proud in spirit is actually a cause of stumbling. Uh, the word a cause of stumbling, literally, the Greek word is scandalon. We get the word scandal from that. A scandal literally is a cause of stumbling. You can have a public scandal, you can have a private scandal, a private scandal but a, a proud spirit will keep any one of us, myself included, out of God's kingdom. And that proud spirit is manifest by a sense of spiritual self-sufficiency, that I'm okay, I'm leading an upright, a moral life, I'm respected within my community, I'm going to be okay in the final judgment without having a deep sense of my need for the Savior. So the poor in spirit acknowledge God as the ultimate source of power for life and meaning, and they reorder their communal lives and their personal lives around caring for those who are physically poor within their communities. And so the, the parable of the pearl in, in Matthew chapter 13, um, Jesus talks about, gives us three parables about the kingdom, and one of them is about the pearl. And in one parable, Jesus says, you know, the kingdom of God is like um, a man who finds a pearl in a field, and he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the land so he can get the pearl. But there's another parable that Jesus teaches where it says the kingdom of God is like a merchant in search of a great pearl. And the point about that parable is that um, the, the, in that parable, the kingdom of God is not the pearl that you find. It is the process of seeking God's kingdom. Because when you're looking for something, that's what you're focused on, isn't it? You know, if you're looking for your passport and you need to leave to the airport in 10 minutes, you're focused on finding that passport. If you're trying to find your car keys in the morning because you've got to rush your kids to school and you're somewhat late, you're really focused on finding those car keys. That's all you're focused on. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl, he's saying to us that to, be, to, to enter his kingdom, that's what you need to be focused on. Everything else fades into insignificance. It's your priority in life. That's all that you're looking for. Your eyes are focused on finding that pearl, which is entry into the kingdom of God. So there, thus, uh, the, for the poor in spirit, there is a letting go of our own sufficiency and a letting God take care of our deeper spiritual needs. It is following Jesus who also emptied himself, according to Philippians 2, 5 through 7. And Jesus himself lived as one of the poor in spirit because he is referred to in the Gospels of Matthew 12 as the servant of God. And the servant of God is drawing on the teachings of Isaiah chapter 6, 11, 42, and 53 as the one who emptied himself and who allowed God's spirit to pervade his being and to guide his steps. And thirdly, the poor in spirit. They live by the principles of God's kingdom today. And so in practical terms, the poor in spirit, they actually strive for the well-being of everybody in their community. Those who are poor in spirit cannot sit idly by while injustices are perpetrated, conflicts are encouraged, and righteousness is trampled upon within society. The, the, the empty hands that are open to receive God's salvation are not made lame by God. God gives us his salvation and he strengthens us so that we can in turn serve our neighbor and love our neighbor as ourselves and meet their needs for bread and health and employment and social, social justice and so forth. Some of the greatest people, I mean, if you look through the history of any nation, certainly I come from England, and if you look through the history of my nation, where I come from, some of the greatest reformers have been people of deep Christian faith. People like Elizabeth Fry, who was a prison reformer, or William Wilberforce, who fought his entire life to abolish slavery, or Charles Dickens. Maybe you're familiar with Charles Dickens, many of his stories, like Oliver Twist. And they're not just novels, they're protests against the poverty of, of Victorian London. And he wrote his novels, that was his form of protest against the social injustice that he saw within his society. So when Jesus talks about the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, He's talking about people who understand that they have a need for the Savior and they order their lives according to the principles of God's kingdom, not the principles of the United Kingdom or South Africa or America or wherever we may happen to come from, but they seek to order their lives according to the principles of God's kingdom. And so we may ask ourselves, if I can turn this, you know, these questions on the screen, you know, do, do we come before God with truly empty hands? Do you come before God with empty hands today? 
Do you come before God with a sense of your desperate need of his salvation and of his grace? I pray that is truly the case. Um, how do we respond to those who are caught up in poverty? And in any nation there is poverty. There is no nation on earth where there is not poverty. And so those who are caught up in poverty represent an ongoing opportunity for those who are poor in spirit, who live by the principles of God's kingdom, to reach out, to lift people out of poverty. Because poverty is a form of, of, of shackles. It ties people down. It shackles the mind and it shackles people's lives in a terrible way. You might also ask the question, in whose kingdom am I living today? Am I building my kingdom? Am I building a business empire here on earth? Am I so focused on my career that I've lost sight of God's kingdom and his principles? Or am I building, or am I living according to the kingdom of God? And is the prince of this world, that is Satan, is he king of my kingdom? Or is Jesus Christ the king of my kingdom? And so beyond my profession of faith and beyond the fact that I may sit in church on a Sabbath morning, which kingdom's values does my practical life truly reflect? When people see your life, do they see a reflection of the kingdom of God or do they see a reflection of the values of the kingdoms of this world? It's a good question to ask ourselves. What do people see when they see us? And so um, that's the first of those beatitudes. So I just want to move on to the next of those beatitudes, which is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this is, this is a beautiful beatitude. Um, I don't know if, if, you know if you watch the news, as one famous actor said recently, said, if you watch the news, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you do watch the news, you're misinformed. All right? And we, we now have fake news around the world, yes? So as a general rule of thumb, you know when the journalists are lying because their lips are moving. But... Um, <clears throat> If you, watch, if you do happen to watch the news, you will see that there is conflict all around the world today. Is that a fair statement? The world is filled with terrible conflict. And we've become used to the sight of people beating their breasts and tearing their clothes and even gashing themselves because of the incredible pain that they find themselves in. And particularly in the Middle East, we see suffering all the time, whether it be the Arab-Israeli conflict or whether it be the conflict in Yemen or wherever else it may happen to be, we are in the time of Jesus. And this beatitude touches deeply on the reality of suffering and death in all of its various forms. And as such, this beatitude, like none of the other beatitudes, represents the fulfillment of more of humanity's hopes than any of the other beatitudes, because everybody wants to be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we've just come through the COVID pandemic, and uh, I'm pretty sure that most of us know somebody who passed away from COVID. Most of us have been touched by COVID one way or the other. We're not going to talk about COVID today, but in general, um, we all know people who've died of COVID or COVID-related complications. We know what it is to see suffering, even if we haven't experienced that grief on a personal level. So what does this beatitude teach us? Because this is a beatitude that really anybody in planet Earth wants to be comforted. Uh, how, what does this beatitude teach us? Well, firstly, it teaches us, well, uh, we look at our society today, coming from America, Hollywood is built on our fallen desires that seem to enjoy watching the suffering of others. Blockbuster movies are built on the assumption that people pay good money to watch other people suffering. The more gruesome the death, the louder the laughs in the movie theater. Nothing could be further from being like Jesus, though. Our societies are also full of social cushions. We have um, pain pills, dieting fads, exercise fads, Take this pill, you lose 20 pounds, so they say. This all promises to reduce our suffering. Eat all you like, never exercise, act unwisely, yet take this pill and all will be okay. But this beatitude has nothing to do with these fallen attitudes. There is mourning and there is grief in our world because there is truly human suffering. And God never created or intended us to suffer. God never intended us for, to grieve the loss of a loved one. It wasn't part of his perfect plan in the Garden of Eden. Yet Jesus, when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, that they will be comforted, that's a divine passive. Jesus is saying that God is going to do the comforting for those who are grieving. In this, in this beatitude, Jesus reveals that there is a God, there is a God who actively comforts, and that he wants to comfort us in our distress today. He knows we're suffering. He is the God who sees us in our distress. Elroy, the story of Hagar, that's the name that she gives God. 
And in this parable, Jesus affirms to us that there is a God who is not a distant watchmaker who's wound up this universe and then disappeared off to another universe. There is a personal loving God who is personally interested in alleviating the pain that we feel when we say goodbye to our loved ones. We also see in this parable that suffering is an extraordinary teacher. Suffering opens the doors to profound wisdom. Some of the most profound literature you will ever read comes out of people who suffered incredibly. So my wife is Russian, and uh, when we first got married, she gave me a book. Um, it was by Tolstoy called War and Peace. And uh, I, I duly and dutifully read it all the way through. And the next year for Christmas, I got another book, I think it was by Dostoevsky, called The Idiot. And um, I duly read that book. It's a novel uh, about some guy who's uh, you know, touched in his brain, you might say. And uh, the year after that, I got another novel from my wife called Crime and Punishment. And I started to think that she was trying to send me a message through the books that she was giving me. Uh, the next year, I got a book called History's 100 Worst Dictators. And again, I'm starting to get paranoid about the state of our marriage here. Uh, so um, a few years later, for Valentine's Day, I gave her a book called The Emperor of All Maladies. Um, maybe you know that book. It's the history of the treatment of cancer. And it's an incredible book, um, but um, she wasn't best pleased with it as a Valentine's Day gift. Um, but uh, I really recommend it. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies. But anyway, um, what this beatitude teaches us is that suffering can open the door to profound wisdom. And uh, for instance, if, if those, who, those who suffered through the czarist concentration camps or the communist concentration camps, they came out with a renewed um, respect for the human spirit and what the human spirit can endure, and what the human spirit can learn as we go through suffering on a personal level. level. Because suffering burns away the froth of daily living, and it rearranges our priorities in a profound way. To become a refugee is horrible. But what I've noticed about refugees in my years with ADRA is that refugees very quickly learn that what matters is life itself, not the possessions you lost in that natural disaster. When you go to a disaster ADRA may send you to, what you soon realize is there are two kinds of people at a disaster. There are those who come to the disaster after it happens, and they are overwhelmed by the sense of physical destruction. But those who survive the disaster, they're overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude for just being alive. And so you may walk the same streets, but the survivors have a very different perspective uh, compared for, with those who come after the disaster itself. We may come after the event and be overwhelmed by the destruction, and take pictures of it, but those who survived are grateful that they have the gift of life. And so suffering um, and surviving suffering can actually engender gratitude towards God for being alive. We also see in, this, in this, this teaching of Jesus that the healing of human brokenness and the alienation in all of its dimensions is at the heart of Jesus' healing ministry. Jesus came to seek out and to save that which was lost. That which was lost is suffering. That which is lost has no hope of eternal life, has no existential meaning or purpose in life. And since sin in the time of Jesus was popularly believed to be the cause of suffering, Jesus' authority over sin was manifest in his authority to heal the sick. Jesus, according to Matthew 8, later in the gospel, verse 17, he took our infirmities and he bore our diseases. He is the only one able to heal our causes for mourning, including alienation from ourselves, from others, and from God. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are three layers of suffering that we find within this Gospel. Firstly, there is what Matthew calls just sickness. The Greek word is nosos. We find this in about ten different places of Matthew's Gospel. You can come and ask me later for the text if you wish. But uh, the sickness, uh, the problem there is of the body, like where does it hurt? Like you press here and you go, ouch. This is a nosos. This is a physical ailment. You then have another kind of illness in the Gospel of Matthew called kakos in the Greek. And this is a problem of communal relationships. There's a breakdown in a marriage. There's a breakdown in a community. And you're not just experiencing physical pain, but you're experiencing social pain. And for this, there is a, mal there is a, a healing that Jesus brings. And the third kind of level of illness that we find in the Gospel of Matthew is known as malachia. We get uh, the word malady from that. And this is a problem of the exclusion of social lepers. For instance, a physical leper, um, he doesn't just come to Jesus for healing, a, a, hepa, a leper comes to Jesus for cleansing, which is altogether much deeper. 
And so how does Jesus respond to these levels of, of sickness? Well, he responds to thick sickness by curing them. The word is therapeuane, from where we get the word therapy. That is, your physical symptoms are now gone. He responds to social illness with therapeuane as well. That is, social healing. That is, being made well and restored to those around you. But he also responds to infirmity, the deepest level, not by therapeuane, but by catharane, which means we get the word cathartic from that. That is to be restored to well-being in society at large. And so we see in the Gospels that Jesus' authority over sin is demonstrated by his authority over all levels of sickness, whether it be physical sickness or social sickness or social alienation. And he has the ability to heal all of those levels of sickness. So what are the implications of this teaching of Jesus? Well, firstly, um, we live, at least in the West, and I'm assuming I'm kind of saying South Africa is part of the West, but in the West, we live in an entertainment-oriented society. People are mad about sports. People are mad about the internet. They're people are mad about movies. They, they, they follow their movie stars, their celebrities, um, and so forth. And the problem we have in the West, though, is that um, when we surf it, when we have an overdose of entertainment, um, when you have entertainment 24-7, this leads to a, a sense of boredom that you cannot shake. And it ultimately leads to a sense of meaninglessness. It's almost like um, spiritual diabetes. It, there's, no, there's no harm in listening to a piece of music that you really enjoy as a form of relaxation. But if your life is consumed by the pursuit of entertainment, you will sooner or later experience an inner listlessness, 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 I need to get that word out, or meaninglessness, that is hard to shake off, whereas suffering reveals to us a depth of meaning that we may never, never otherwise achieve. And if in our entertainment we revel in the sufferings of others, not only are we fostering meaninglessness within ourselves, but we're separating ourselves from Jesus, because Jesus never looked upon suffering humanity with anything other than compassion and sought to heal them. He never laughed at the misfortunes of others when we pay good money to laugh at the misfortunes of others in the movies. This hard-heartedness to the sufferings of others means that we actually close our hearts to the heart of God and we start to lose that state of being blessed today. So be careful what you feed your minds on. Be careful what you choose for your entertainment options and how much entertainment you choose and because you may be finding that you're separating yourself from the heart of God, you're removing yourselves from God's blessing and that you are feasting on the very things that Jesus died to save you from. We also see in this, this teaching of Jesus that the righteous mourn over the sufferings of those around them. They do not merely cross the road or succumb to compassion fatigue. They're not indifferent to the suffering within their given society. Rather, they are stirred to action. When we turn a blind eye, when we look the other way, when we switch channels to a less distressing scene on the news, when we avoid unpleasant topics, and when we pretend to be unaware that our loved ones or our neighbors or our brothers and sisters are suffering, all of those decisions tend to separate us from our Heavenly Father. The more we focus on our own need for comfort and ignore those who grieve around us, the more we close ourselves to God. It is in actively bringing comfort to those who mourn that we open ourselves to God's comfort and blessing in our own lives. So if you know somebody in your congregation who is suffering, who is maybe grieving the loss of a loved one due to COVID or cancer, uh, maybe reach out to them. Um, you may not see them during the Sabbath, but give them a call during the week and just say, I want to pray for you. Send them a note of encouragement. And I can assure you that will be, a, that will be the, maybe the high spot of their day, the bright spot of their day. And they will remember that for a long, long time. You know, you can, you can have a grand gesture if you want, but people remember the small things of life. And it's those, those small touches that help people get through those difficult times. And you'll also find that when you actually pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm thinking of you, can we just pray together? or you send somebody a card, more often than not, you will find that that phone call or that card or that email or that text arrived at a crucial moment in that person's spiritual journey. And it just helped them get over a, a really difficult moment that they, that they were going through at that time. Because grief comes in waves. Grief and mourning comes in waves. Uh, if you've lost a loved one to cancer, you will find that about a year after they've passed away, when the anniversary comes by, grief will hit you like a wave. If you've lost a spouse to COVID, the grief will hit you at your wedding anniversary. That, you know, it comes in waves at significant events. And so reaching out to somebody because you know there's an anniversary coming up, um, not only do you minister to them and help them through that difficult moment, 
but you're opening your own heart to God's comfort for the sufferings that you're going through. We also see in this teaching of Jesus that those who survive a storm or natural disaster are often those who are most grateful to God just for being alive. And while we are not to seek suffering, we do tend to grow the most spiritually when we go through difficult times in life. When you have your New Year's resolutions, nobody says when they have a New Year's resolution, this year I'd like to get cancer. I, mean, I don't know of anybody who says that. Most people, when they have New Year's resolutions, say, I'd like to get a new job, I'd like to get a better, better car, we need, a, we need a larger home, we have a growing family, um, I want to you know, lose a few pounds, put a few you know, uh, rand in the bank, whatever it may, the case may be. We have these positive New Year intentions, but the reality is when you look back at your life, when did you grow the most spiritually? It wasn't when there were rand in the bank and a nice car in the driveway and a nice home to drive home to every night. You grow, we grow the most spiritually when we go through suffering. And so even though we do not like suffering, suffering is not something to be rejected in and of itself, but rather the opportunity for us to grow and to ask ourselves, Heavenly Father, how do you want me to grow through this? How are you shaping me through this? What dross are you burning out of my character, out of my life? as I go through this suffering experience. Because God knows what is happening to us. And he, sometimes he allows us to go through suffering. Sometimes we face suffering as a result of our own sinful decisions. But he allows us to go th through things because he's still trying to shape us and prepare us for eternity. And so suffering is not the absence of God's presence in our life. Sometimes it's actually God um, being very close to you. You know, if you're a gardener and you want to prune your roses, um, if you have a garden, if you're a gardener, you have some roses, the gardener is never closer to the roses than when he's pruning the roses. Yes? The gardener is closest to his roses when he's pruning them. He's actually got his hands on them, and he's holding the rose very delicately, and he's snipping a bit here and snipping a bit there. And it's not a nice experience for the rose, but that's what enables the rose to achieve its full potential. Because if roses are left to themselves, what happens to them? They grow inwards. And they, they turn into this jumble. But if you're going to have a beautiful rose display, you need a gardener who's willing to hold that rose and snip it and, 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 and with the shears and chop bits off and bend it here and bend it there. And that's when the rose can achieve its full potential. So going through suffering isn't the sign that God has abandoned you or lost you or forgotten about you. It may well be that God is shaping you through that process in a profound way. We also see in this, power, this teaching of Jesus, this beatitude that... The righteous, they mourn over their own shortcomings, their sins and sinfulness, and they are comforted through receiving the gift of God's forgiveness in a personal experience of grace. I just want to ask you today, when did you last experience God's grace? When, not when you last read about grace or when you heard a song like Amazing Grace, but when did you last experience God's grace for yourself? When were you overwhelmed with God's goodness to you, with God's mercy to you, with the sense that I really messed up here, and yet God has carried me through. It's important for us to think about those things. When was the last time we experienced God's grace? Blessed are those who mourn, says Jesus, for they will be comforted. We may experience God's grace when we start grieving for our own sins and our shortcomings and our sinfulness, when we start to be concerned about when we fall short of the image of God, when we, we realize that I'm not doing, what, I'm, I'm really not all that God asks of me, that there are, there, are, there, are, there are sins in my life. There are, these days we don't call it sin anymore. We say uh, there are challenges in my life. We'll use, we, we, we water down the language a bit. But to recognize that I am a sinner and that despite all my righteous deeds in my own eyes, in the eyes of God, they are as filthy rags. And I have nothing to commend myself before God. And I struggle with this sin and I struggle with that sin and I struggle with that sin over there. And that's the truth of the matter. And those who mourn, not just for others, but they mourn over their own shortcomings, they mourn over their grief, they are most open to receiving the gift of God's forgiveness and to personally experience God's grace. This salvation from sin, in all of its forms that Jesus offers us, restores to us the possibility of being restored to the image of God. So in this beatitude, Jesus is inviting us this morning to reflect today on the Sabbath and through this coming week on our own personal brokenness, for us to admit our own sin and our selfishness and to recognize that we will only be comforted when we recognize that we are sinners in need of a savior. With David in Psalm 51, in Psalm 51, he wrote Psalm 51 after his sin with Bathsheba. 
we need to admit that our most serious sin does not refer to our external actions, but to those parts of our hearts where we have yet to allow God to rule, where the kingdom of self rules supreme rather than the kingdom of God. So as we withhold parts of our innermost beings from God, we find that we're alienated from God and we're unable to receive his full comfort and blessedness. Unless we open our hearts to God, the, the Greek word for heart is cardia. We get the word cardiac arrest from that, I guess. But in Matthew 15, 19, in fact, Jesus talks about the heart, the cardia in this gospel repeatedly. But unless we open our hearts to God, our fallen hearts will be at the center of our lives. If God is not the treasure of our heart, as per Matthew 7, 21, to that innermost degree, I will remain alienated from God. Thus to mourn for my own sin, my alienation from God, requires a new heart. And without the new heart, I cannot experience the blessedness and comfort that God wishes for me. So I want to challenge you today. We come and we look good on Sabbath morning. We dress in our nice fancy clothes and all the rest of it. Um, but let's recognize that at the, bottom, at the end of the day, we're sinners in need of a savior. That from the moment we're born, we're in the process of dying, whether we like it or not. And life is really brief, isn't it? Like when I was a teenager, I thought life just stretches on indefinitely ahead of you. And now my son has gone beyond his teenage years. And it's hard to imagine that life goes quite so fast. And you, you, you reach a stage in life where you realize, you know, the psalmist says, teach us the brevity of days that we may gain wisdom. Uh, the idea that when we realize how short life really is, we start looking for eternal answers because we know there must be more to life and existence than just 70 years on this cursed planet of ours. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, he's inviting us at the, at the fundamental level to grieve our own sinfulness and to ask God for his forgiveness and for his grace and to ask God to change us and to give us a new heart that delights to do God's will rather than our own fallen wills. Then we come to the third beatitude that we're going to look at through this Sabbath school and let me just check our time here, make sure how much time we've got. All right, we have some time for this. Okay, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. The question, in South African culture, is meekness something that is celebrated? No. I don't know of any society where to be meek, uh, where somebody says, oh, he's a very meek man, that's not really um, a compliment, is it? Nobody wants to be known as, you know, uh, Edgar the meek or, or Johan the meek. Um, we'd run a mile rather than be called Edgar the Meek. Why? Because the weak are considered to be weak and to be doormats. They're viewed as being timid, as easily dominated and easily exploited. In the U.S. in the 1980s, there was um, a scandal with the banks um, lending money to people who had no, res no reason to be borrowing money. They couldn't pay it back. And there was one guy who went to jail because he wrote an internal memo to his bank. And he said, remember, he said, the weak, the meek, and the ignorant are always good targets. And so when, we, when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, we think, wait, 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 there, something's not quite right here. Why does Jesus celebrate something that nobody looks up to in our Western society today? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what is Jesus talking about in this uh, beatitude? Well, the Greek word for land is ge, we get the word geography from that, G-E, then we got geography, uh, graphy is writing, so geography is writings about land. The Greek word for land mirrors the Hebrew word Eretz, like Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. You could hear in that lady's voice almost like the, the worry, like the fire is right by my house here. And so people are worried about losing what they have. You hear it in their voices. People tend to panic when they think they're going to lose their material possessions. But in this Psalm 37, Jesus, uh, the, the psalmist contrasts two ways to live in the land, either through violence or through meekness. Those who do not have any trust in God, they use their, they, they, they seek through evil doing to, to protect their positions as individuals or groups or as a nation. And the psalmist is warning against using land-based attitudes as the foundation for our lives. Rather, if you look at verse 3 of Psalm 37, we are urged to do something different. He says, trust in the Lord and do good so you will live in the land and enjoy security. So the key to, living in, to, the key to living in the land is through trust in the Lord, not through violence against others, as he describes elsewhere within that particular psalm. Now, scripturally speaking, the word earth and land are synonymous with each other. But in Jesus' day and in our day, these concepts are very different. And why do I say that? Well, Psalm 24 
verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And so the earth and all that within it belongs to God. Would you agree with me? Yeah, the earth and everything within it belongs to God. But the Israelites had come to distinguish between the earth as belonging to God, but the land, that is the promised land, belongs to them. And this is a modern phenomenon as well. We say, yes, the earth belongs to God, but this bit of land here belongs to me. And I'm going to fight to keep my piece of land. And we fight to keep our piece of land, whether it's our plot of land here in Johannesburg or Pretoria, or whether it's a tribe or a clan defending their territory, such as, I don't know, the Native American tribes of North America, or through nations fighting to defend their plot of land upon planet Earth. And most wars in history have occurred because people are fighting for land, one way or the other, and the, and the value that that land represents. When the land is mine and it's not yours, then I am obliged to defend my possession of the land. Thus, there is always the potential for land-based violence. And when land-based value systems operate with concepts of personal honor or national prestige, then you find national leaders are all too ready to make war because a loss of land, no matter how insignificant, is really viewed as a, loss, a, as a loss of national honor. And so presidents are only too happy to go to war to fight for some distant plot of land because if we lose that land, we lose prestige and we lose face. And oftentimes that land is not worth an awful lot at all, but people fight because that's our bit of land. Stalin understood this well. When, when Stalin was the premier of the Soviet Union, he'd look at the Soviet republics and let's say Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and the, let's say this is the historical border that everybody recognizes. Well, Stalin would redraw the border so a bit of Uzbekistan is now included in Tajikistan and then he, the border comes around here so a bit of Tajikistan is now linked with Uzbekistan and so now that the, these two republics are always at each other's throats, they're fighting for their bit of land. And it's an entirely artificial setup by Stalin to divide and conquer the republics of the Soviet Union. Violence is often initiated by one group in society against another when one group is threatened by the potential loss of land because land comes, with land comes financial wealth and production capacity. And so at a national level, this underlying lack of trust in God for our basic security serves as, serves as a justification for military preemptive strikes. And in the day of Jesus, the land of Samaria, Judea, and Galilee was occupied by men of might. They were the Romans. They occupied the promised land. They were opposed by the zealot, the land of Israel, from Roman rule. Alternatively, the Pharisees insisted that the land of Israel belonged to the Jews by virtue of its descent from Abraham. God promised this land to Abraham, therefore the land belongs to us, therefore the Romans need to leave. But Jesus denies that the land will be divided according to biological descent or military might. He denies these two bases for the possession of land that we even have today. You know, no nation survives unless it has the military means to defend its land. That's a fact of life today. You know, no revolution takes place unless there is military might involved. The French Revolution wouldn't have taken place without fighting. And the American Revolution wouldn't have taken place without fighting. And the, or the revolutions around the world, the Romanian Revolution in, what, 1990 against Ceausescu, they only overthrew the communists because they were willing to take up arms against the communists there, against Ceausescu and his regime. Ultimately, modern nations are based upon military might, and are we willing to defend our land no matter what the price against all comers? But Jesus denies the land is to be divided according to biological descent or military might. Rather, according to Jesus, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So those who inherit the kingdom made new will neither inherit it because they are descended from the right family or have more powerful weapons than other people today. The meek are blessed today because their lives are built around trusting God. God's going to take care of them. Their basic needs are going to be met. And as such, they're not consumed by the fear of loss, which often dominates the minds of the wealthy. Now, I don't know... I've, no, I've never been to this church before, but I've been a pastor long enough to know that the wealthier people are, the more they tend to worry about losing their wealth. That the wealthier people are, they become addicted to following the stock market. They want to know what happened to the Dow Jones or the FTSE 100 or the Hang Seng Index on a daily basis. They want to watch the Dow Jones on the ticker tape on their TVs or their computers by the minute 
and their mood changes through the day depending on what happens to the dollar index or the Dow Jones index. But the, the wealthier people are, the more they tend to be consumed by fear of loss rather than by gratitude to God for the gift of life. So what are the implications of this beatitude of Jesus? Well, firstly, he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That is, God gives them their needs. We own nothing of ourselves. Once we get into the land of the comfortable home and the fast car and the tenured professorship and the upscale neighborhood and the annual summer holiday and investments in fine art, it's easy to forget that it was God, not ourselves, who brought us to this point in life. But in scripture, the land, as all our possessions, are always an inheritance from God. Yes, Joshua led the Israelites in the conquest of Canaan, but the land was always a gift from God. For, for us, the land is God's to give. We have no absolute rights over our material possessions. We're stewards of what God has given us. And if we're to be faithful stewards, we're to use those stewards to be a blessing to those around us, not for self-gratification. But stewards, we, we are not absolute owners, but we actually represent God to his creation. Uh, turn in your Bibles to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and you see there that Moses has his promise from God to the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, <clears throat> And this is the promise to the Israelites as they're about to enter the promised land. And Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 9, <clears throat> God's promise to the people of Israel is, if you enter the promised land and you follow my commandments and you are faithful to the covenant, you will live in, quote, verse 9, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing. And so God's intent for the people of Israel was that nobody should want for anything that nobody should have a lack of the basic essentials of life. That was part of the promise of the promised land. It wasn't just a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land where the milk and honey was shared equally so that everybody had their basic needs met. God did not intend to have these extremes of wealth and poverty like in America. We have extremes of wealth and poverty right now. And the top 1% in America own pretty much what the, the equivalent of the rest of 99%. We have a few extremely rich families like the Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon and Zuckerberg who owns Facebook and uh, a few others. Um, who's the guy who owns Tesla? Elon Musk. <clears throat> I mean, these, these people have such wealth. We have such extremes of poverty and wealth. But that was never God's plan for any society. When he led them into the promised land, part of the promise of the promised land, nobody would lack anything. And so those who are meek, they, they say that um, I'm going to order my life and my household of faith and, if we can, the national economy in such a way that nobody lacks the basics of life. Regardless of who you are or where you come from, it is not God's will that people get caught up in the grinding shackles of poverty. Why is this important? Because when the land becomes our bottom line rather than God's will in our lives, we forget that everything we own is inheritance from God. We become delusional in our false pride and we separate ourselves from God. And when we, when we forget that the land is a gift from God rather than ours as an absolute right, the pursuit of wealth takes precedence over seeking God's kingdom in our lives. So we need to be careful as we live in the 21st century. Are we, building, are we, are we storing up for ourselves treasures in, in earth or in treasures in heaven above? As Jesus says later in this, this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, there are five sermons in the Gospel of Matthew we're just kind of reflecting on the first of those sermons here this morning. But um, when the pursuit of wealth takes precedence over the seeking of God's kingdom, um, then we run the dire danger of losing that internal inheritance. For the blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus is ultimately talking about the kingdom made new, the earth made new uh, at the end of all things. So the ordering of the house or the economy is ordered um, in our own lives today to help those who have not. You know, the word for household in Greek is oikos. And Jesus talks about the oikos. And the word oikos is the basis for our word economy. The national economy is the national household. And the laws that we pass in our congresses and our parliaments and, and our legislatures reflects the values of our nations. And when the values of our nations make the wealthy wealthier and the poor poorer, something is wrong. We may ask ourselves in our church family as well, do the decisions we make, do they seek to bless those who have not? 
they seek to give a hand, uh, a, a help up, not a handout, but a help people to stand up on their own two feet. Do we take care of those in our midst who have not today, who are struggling to pay their bills today? You know, the chances are in any congregation, maybe here today, there may be single mothers here today who are struggling to pay their bills. There may be somebody who's just going through a bankruptcy or a divorce and is struggling to pay their bills. And it's our privilege as Christians to help them out in their hour of need. I help you when you need help, and you're going to help me when I need help. And knowing that there are people around you who will help you in your moment of need takes away a huge amount of stress in life because you know that you can call on people in your moment of need. If, even if you never call upon them, at least you know that there are brothers and sisters who will stand by you in your hour of need. So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, implies that the meek order their, the household of faith, that is the church, and their household at home, and the national economy, they order it in a way so that everybody's needs are taken care of. We also see in this beatitude of Jesus is that the meek work to ensure that those in need have their basic needs met. Now, I'm not a socialist. I may sound like a socialist, but I ain't a socialist. I, 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 I've seen what socialism has done in many countries, and it destroys countries quicker than anything else. I'm not a socialist, but as a Christian, I recognize that God has blessed me incredibly, and those blessings are not given to a closed fist, but they're given to an open hand. If I have open hands to receive God's blessings, I, open, I also have open hands to share God's blessings. And the more I share God's blessings, the more God puts blessings into my life. I cannot outgive God. And so when you experience grace for yourself and you start recognizing those in need around you um, and you start to help those out, what you will find is that God will bless you more than you give to other people. I want to challenge you today to be looking for brothers and sisters in this church of faith, this household of faith, and to be asking yourself, how can I be a blessing to my congregation, to my brothers and sisters? You can give directly. You can help people anonymously. It's not necessarily money. It could be of your time. It could be, I hear you have a hospital appointment. Do you need a lift to the hospital? All right. It could be, I hear you've broken your leg. Do you need help with the shopping, getting the daily, the, the weekly food in? We all have an opportunity. We all have the means and the time and the gifts to be a blessing to those around us. We're not just talking about money here. Jesus, and thirdly, in this beatitude of Jesus, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Later on in, in the next sermon, Matthew 10 and 11, he describes himself as being meek. He says, for I am meek and humble. So when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he's inviting us to be like him. To be like Jesus, we are to seek meekness for ourselves. And when we come to Jesus and accept his yoke, rather than the yokes of imperial power or ecclesiastical infallibility, or land-based values, or the continual worry over loss that the wealthy experience, only then will we find rest for our souls. That we will find rest from the freedom, from the nagging fear of loss, and start to trust that God will indeed take care of our daily needs. This rest uh, is the same rest that the dove found when it was sent out from the ark in Genesis 8. It was the same rest that the Israelites found when they entered the promised land, and it is the same rest that Naomi wished for her two daughters-in-law in Ruth chapter 1 and Ruth chapter 3. So, says Jesus, the blessed will inherit the earth. Uh, let's look at a few questions for reflection here. I hope this uh, moves to our slide. Uh, we've gone all the way back. All right, so. There we are. So let me ask you today. Do I own my property? Or am I a steward of this property that God has entrusted me with? What's my attitude towards my possessions? Not just my, the rand or the cars that I own, but my time and the spiritual gifts that he gives me. Am I a steward of those assets? Secondly, in what ways do I or my family marginalize the poor and the voiceless? Do I care for the poor and the voiceless? Do I speak up for them? Um, I've discovered during this whole COVID crisis, as some of you know, I've achieved a certain notoriety on the internet, but I've discovered that when you speak up for those who don't have a voice, God blesses you in powerful ways. When you risk everything, I mean, I, I, in, in this, COVID, this whole COVID situation, um, I stand to gain nothing personally by speaking up for those who are marginalized and ignored, um, but I 
that God's blessing more than outweighs any negativity, any negativity that comes my way. And so, um, do we look out for those who are on the margins, on the fringes, who have no voice? And what does the meekness and the nonviolence of Jesus teach me today? Because Jesus himself describes himself as being, for I am meek and humble of heart. What does that mean for me today? Is there an example there for me to follow? Is there um, a promise within this beatitude? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These beatitudes of Jesus, um, they're not just simple phrases that you kind of memorize in Pathfinders and then you forget about for the rest of your life. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, I invite you to turn there, and I think our time is almost up here. Who does Jesus give these beatitudes to? Well, the answer is he's not speaking to the general crowd here. He's speaking to those who claim to be his followers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying. So these teachings of Jesus are not given so much for the wider world. They're given for those who claim to be followers of Jesus. And he's giving us the charter of the kingdom of God. He's explaining, this is what it means to be in my kingdom. This, is, this goes beyond being a Seventh-day Adventist. These are the basic principles of the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. Repent, he said at the beginning of his ministry, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if we're to live by the principles of the kingdom of God, then we need to put aside the principles of the nations in which we live and the cultures from where we come in order that we can embrace the principles of God's kingdom. Blessed, said Jesus, are the poor in spirit. Do you have a sense of dependency upon God today? Do you have a sense of your need of God's salvation? Or are we coming today into this church with a sense that I'm okay, God needs to accept my worship because I'm a decent person? If we come with a sense of our own self-sufficiency with full hands, we cannot receive God's grace because our hands are full with our own self-sufficiency. Blessed, said Jesus, are those who mourn. Are you coming today with a sense of grief at our, at our own sinfulness? The fact that I am a sinner in need of God's grace. Do I come here with a sense that I will no longer take pleasure in the suffering of others. I will no longer participate in the systems of this world that rejoice and make money off the suffering of others. Because if I do that, then I'm separating myself from God because we're all God's children. Blessed, said Jesus, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A beautiful beatitude there. Jesus described himself as meek, and those who are meek have learned to trust in God that their daily needs will be met in this world and in the world to come. Is his promise. So these are the first of the three Beatitudes. We'll, can you, we'll continue working through these Beatitudes in our worship service, and we'll conclude them this afternoon. We'll move on to some other topics after that this afternoon. But I want to challenge you today. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, and we are called to live by the principles of his kingdom, not by the principles of the nations in which we live. And as we live by these principles of God's kingdom, we each of us will start to experience the blessedness that this world cannot give. We start to experience the peace that passeth understanding because it comes from God. And we know that whatever else happens in life, you know, whether we survive the rest of this day or we die in a road accident on the way home tonight or whether we're healthy today and dead from COVID next Sabbath, whatever may happen to us in this world, in each of these promises, there's the promise of eternal life for those who live by the principles of Jesus' kingdom. So I challenge you today, live by the principles of Jesus' kingdom and start to experience the blessedness that only God can give. Thank you very much.